Okay, so what you're looking at here is one of our systems. This is a shipping container based systems, which are very popular right now. Uh, most of the shipping container systems that I get approached by to, to maybe analyze or to review are completely contained inside the shipping container. What you're looking at here is a unique design. This is why I like to work with this model where there's a fish farm in the container and on top of the container is a greenhouse. In New Mexico, we have some of the best sunlight conditions in all of the U.S. And so we're going to take advantage of that natural sunlight. Many of the systems that I see lately on the market are completely indoors and they're using LED grow lights or fluorescent grow lights to illuminate their plants to get photosynthesis. But why would you do that when you have ample sunlight? So I like the idea that we've taken advantage of that here. And the unique thing of this is that this is an off-grid system. I power the system through solar PV, photovoltaics. These three panels on the left are charging batteries constantly. Again, we get amazing amount of sunlight here in New Mexico. So I get about 16 hours of light during part of the year that's charging these batteries. And I've got about a four day battery life inside. Uh, we'll go inside and I'll show you that, that technology. But for four days, this can be running with totally cloudy day because I've backed it up with batteries. Uh, just behind me, the three larger panels are solar thermal panels. Solar thermal is used to heat the water. So because we're at 7,000 foot elevation in the wintertime, we get plenty of snow, we get very cold temperatures. And I'm trying to grow tilapia, koi, and goldfish in this container right now. So I'm going to have to heat the water in the wintertime. Uh, that happens for free using the solar thermal system. A very low wattage pump uh, moves, circulates water through the hydronic system of these panels into the shipping container. There's a hydronic system there with thermostats and pumps, and we can deliver the water into our sump of our fish tank system. And that water, the hot water, will release the heat into the system and kind of manage our water temperature that way. So otherwise, when we're not using it, like now it's a summer day, uh, we don't use it. So on the top is an emitter, and you can see the fine emitters that are just releasing the heat that we don't need. Uh, a nice thing that we could do here, if this was on my farm, I'd have a hot tub sitting on the side. I'd use that excess heat for something. Right now, it just bleeds off into the environment. Um, again, fish tanks inside, tilapia, koi, and goldfish. It really doesn't matter what fish you use. As far as aquaponics, basically they're the aquatic composter. So I like to show diversity. I like to show we can do different things. Many of my students are vegan. Uh, many of my students are Buddhist. They don't want anything to do with sacrificing an animal, but they love this concept that they can feed their fish, get to know their personality in the case of a koi, and never sacrifice the animals, but still get luscious plants. Um, so this could be, again, because it's off grid, we could put this anywhere. This could be sited at a refugee camp. We could have a series of these and feeding people without energy input um, besides the sun. This is designed also for that restaurateur who wants a small system around their restaurant. They can go out back and harvest all their culinary herbs, which are high value crops, so they don't have to pay for those high value crops. And culinary herbs don't ship well, so why not grow them right next to the restaurant? Um, so again, for a lot of reasons, I've adopted this system. This is a prototype. We are beta testing this and I'm pushing it to the limits. So what you see now is not what you would get if you bought this unit. There's more advancements, especially in the area of automation and controlling. So this, un this company is now located in the Caribbean. They can look at all the parameters that are happening in the fish component upstairs in the greenhouse. But in the near future, they'll be able to control the systems as well. Maybe acid injections, or a base injection. Um, so different things, iron for instance, is often needs uh, supplements in an aquaponic set setting. So they can do that soon through automation and controlling. So keep your eye on farminapod.com. Keep your eye on my Facebook page for Santa Fe Community College and you'll find out more about what's going on here. I'd be happy to talk to anybody outside of the videos here. Um, you can find my contact through Kentucky State University. Okay. Okay, from the inside, uh, again, this is not rocket science. With any fish aquaculture system, I think we should make it simple for the producer. So over here may look complex. This is just your hydronic system for heating the water. That's all this is. The copper pipes are bringing that hot water in. Uh, we have thermostat set here, small pumps that are moving the water through. This is charged with water and glycol. Um, the propylene glycol prevents freezing in the wintertime. And if you follow the system of hydronics, it's going to come all the way to the sump of your fish tank. 
And there's a coil in that sump, and that's what's releasing the heat as needed. Um, so that's really the most complex part of this whole unit. Some of the other guiding principles are insulation. So again, we're focused on energy efficiency, uh, water use and reuse, nutrient recycling and food production. So these walls, for instance, um, that's about four inch thick spray insulation. I believe this system has about an R10. So it's a very insulated building. We keep things tight, very tight. Um, I've got aeration in the system and I have a water pump and that's really my main energy use. This system runs on about 300 watts of electricity. And so obviously, as I said, we get the energy for free, but we're running less energy than a household hair dryer to run a whole fish farm and an aquaponic farm. Um, I've got four fish tanks here. The water flows into the, each fish tank from the back delivery, and this is your drain line from all four fish tanks. They all drain into a centralized sump where there's a low energy pump that pumps water in two directions. It pumps water upstairs to the greenhouse and it recycles back and it pumps water back through your fish tanks. So we split the flow between the fish and the plants. Um, the only other unit here that uh, demands electricity is a small air blower. Right here is a ventilation fan. That ventilation fan takes this carbon dioxide rich from uh, water from fish respiration and pumps it up to the greenhouse because the plants can use that to increase their photosynthesis. And then that, water, that air, after it's stripped of CO2, will return back to my fish barn here. So we're trying to reduce the CO2 here and give it to the plants, which can take advantage of that. Um, and what, one other thing to mention here, in the rare event that we don't have the hot water that we need because maybe there's a cloud event or a snowstorm comes through for a week and I can't get those solar panels to heat up, the solar thermal, this is just a mini boiler that's put in place as a backup. If I need a temperature control, this kicks on. This will run about 1500 watts. Um, so it's rare that this is ever on in this system, but with, the, um, with that rare event of not having the sun come out here, uh, we do have a backup system in place to heat our water back up. Um, again, fish selection is uh, depending on the user's goals. I've got uh, tilapia in this tank. I'm a fish farmer. I produce food for humanity. That's why I do what I do. I'm using plants to clean the nutrient-rich water. That's an after effect of my fish farm. Um, I also have down the line a couple tanks of koi and a tank at the end of goldfish. They're all doing the same thing, uh, providing nutrients for my plants above. And again, as I mentioned, I use an optimal fish food. Uh, all these fish are on a floating fish food at this stage. And I find this feed to be very palatable. My fish love it. And I'm starting to do growth trials and they're growing extremely fast on this uh, optimal fish food diet. Um, other than feeding the fish, all I'm doing is maintaining the proper pH. pH in my aquaponic systems, my sweet spot is 6.4. Um, there's been wisdom in the past to keep it at 7.0 so your bacteria are happy, your fish are happy, and your plants are happy. I tend to push it down to 6.4. That way I favor the plant production. I'm making more money with my plants. Um, ammonia is not as toxic at 6.4 versus 7.0 and more nutrients are available to the plants. So I have found a sweet spot for all my systems at 6.0, uh, 6.4, and so that's what I maintain. So just like with any other system, um, nitrification is gonna push your pH down. So I do need to be in a habit of pushing my pH up. So I use, personally, I use a calcium hydroxide and a potassium hydroxide still. Same recommendations we've given at Kentucky State, we've given at the University of the Virgin Islands. Um, a reminder, those are not organically certified. So if I wanted to be an organic, certified organic grower, I'm going to switch to carbonates, potassium carbonate and potassium and calcium carbonate. Uh, the one issue with those, they're not as soluble. So you do need to make sure that they're well mixed as you're adding it to your system. But otherwise, I'm just maintaining my pH, proper temperature, oxygen for the fish, and I'm pretty golden here. Uh, everything seems to work fine. Um, I will watch the ammonia the nitrite and the nitrate maybe weekly, but understanding feeding rate to plant area, I never run into problems. I do that just as a spot check to make sure everyone's in a, in a happy environment, uh, but I don't have those issues when I feed the proper rate to the plants that are pulling out those nutrients.
Okay, so this is upstairs in the farm pod. Again, this this is a beta test. We're, we're helping this company design their system. Uh, one thing that's lacking here is good proper ventilation in this greenhouse. So we're gonna put some uh, shutters and fans up in the, in the gable ends here uh, to get more airflow. It's causing a little bit of issues with powdery mildew. But we're really taking data for this company. So we're running through every type of crop you can think of from things like kale where we pick the big leaves and then they'll regrow. So we're taking all this data. We do quite a bit of lettuce production because that's a nice quick turnaround crop. Uh, my technician is actually planting broccoli. So we're seeing if broccoli works. But uh, next to this, you'd have, uh, this is marjoram down here, chamomile. I see sage back there and stevia. Again, trying to focus on that culinary herb production as well. We've taken data for every type of lettuce you can think, um, tomatoes and dill and basils. Um, so again, the diversity is what we're looking for here. That's what the company wants is run a diverse crop mix and give me yields. So on these systems, you've got a main line above each row of towers that shoots out a little bit of that fish water down each tower. Um, this is a zip grow tower, a product by uh, Bright Agritech. It's got a recycled plastic matrix um, that's uh, it's, uh, reusable. So in between crops, we just take out the plants, pull out the roots, and put a new transplant in there with the same media. I do have worms in every one of these columns because we are getting good fish solids that are coming down into these towers. So I've got worms processing some of that. A couple of the issues that we always have is because of the organic uh, nutrient solution, I do get clogging of my emitters occasionally. So I'm always having to kind of clean my lines out to, or make sure that they're not clogged. Um, and then I've had issues, and everybody here should be aware, going vertical, there's potential to get water dripping from one of these bottom leaves onto the edible portion of the crop below. We're really doing a lot of work to fix that problem. We're pitching our towers just enough so that water stays towards the backside. Um, but if you do get water dripping, uh, as from my experience, it's not a food safety issue. I would definitely eat it and I have for almost 20 years. But a food safety regulator, that would be a red flag to see fish water dripping on crops that are usually consumed raw like a lettuce. Um, so we're working on those little issues with that. Um, otherwise, it's, it's pruning and it's training and it's managing these crops uh, seven days a week. This, just because it's novel and it's vertical doesn't mean it's any other, any easier method of farming. At the end of the day, this is still farming. Um, probably right now without my vents open, I'm standing in about a 100 degree greenhouse, maybe a 90 degree greenhouse. On a hot Santa Fe day, this could get 130 degrees. So without the proper climates, you're not going to get proper plant growth. And so we're working on these. Uh, to harvest these towers, I just I take the main line and I cut it off, and the towers themselves come right out. You lift up, and then at the bottom they'll swing out, and then I can take this out, and now I can harvest the crops if I need to harvest a whole crop of lettuce. This is thyme, or margarine actually, and I can do my cut and come again. I can clean up my crops, and then I can get them right back in the tower. Um, so what I find with these, if I'm growing lettuce and I'm taking a whole head, a tower of lettuce, it's almost a two-person job to take these out, to pull your lettuce out, pull your matrix out, clean the roots out, put your transplants back in. Um, so I do find it a little time consuming. So vertical racks, they seem like the panacea that we're going to save the world growing vertically. Um, I think they have a lot of issues to overcome. And I do like this, again, this model because we're using natural sunlight. Um, that's great. If I'm looking at vertical systems indoors in a container, now I've got to provide complete light, and that's a huge carbon footprint. So we really need to be critical thinkers uh, as we look at the new technologies in aquaponics. Farmingapod.com. <laughs>